So this fellow at the new iron works in Sunny Bay, where I am a cost sheet man and he is a furnace man, he comes over to me at the iron man, the iron man, the iron man. I'm still in my blue serge suit and collar, though the fellas in their overalls know me as an okay guy. Even if they treat me like a hapless little brother, so this fellow Zach spots me as soon as he sets foot in the door. I'm sitting on a stool at the bar, counting the smoked almonds I'm eating, and sort of working the numbers of how many I have to eat to cover the cost of the beer in front of me. Wishing I could dare pull out a scrap of paper and do some downright figuring. But that would only undercut my standing among these fellows around me who I'm trying to be part of. The sort of fellows that used to daily snap my suspenders and tweak my nose when we were little boys. So this fellow Zack Chris past his friends making straight for me and he claps me on the back <laughs> causing me to reverse my almond count from 20 back to 19. <laughs> Most of the 20th one attaching itself to the mirror behind the bar. Milton, he says, and he proceeds for the fourth time in four days to urge me to take his sister-in-law on the iron workers I ride, which is now a mere two days off, even though, even though he has confessed about her having a cork leg. <laughs> I say I am all for tired nights. An excuse I have not yet tried on him. And he perches on the stool next to me with a face crumpled up in skepticism. I don't blame him. He shovels coal. I add numbers. He knows this. I know this. Tired eyes, I say. Tired eyes. It's dark, he says. It's dark. You got nothing much to look at except Minnie. And she's easy on the eyes, 
I'm telling you And that other thing you know It wears a shoe <laughs> And stocking just like the good one <laughs> I nod and begin gnawing the tiny brown skin off a new almond this is not my usual method. Manny's brother-in-law's making me nervous. He lowers his voice and he leans in near. Look, nobody but you knows about this leg thing. She walks real good and she dresses up nice. The others will think you're a regular fan. I turn the almond over like a squirrel to know the other side. <laughs> I taught up all the sums of his remark. The others don't already think I'm a regular fellow. I'm not a regular fellow. If she can hide her cork leg, I can hide my irregular felonies. Zach has let me in on a family secret with all the obligations and reciprocities attended there too. Though, I have to point out, I never solicited this secret. It was Zach who took the stocking off the rubber foot, so to speak. No, erase that. He let the cat out of the bag. There's a reason for saying things the way everyone else says them. How about it, Zach says. The almond is bare and white in my hand that gives me the willies. I slip it in my mouth out of sight and I chew fast, knowing I'm about to get popped on the back again. And then I turn to Zach and I say, All right. <laughs> this much I take pains to learn from Zach. Minnie's leg is missing from well above the knee. She is 27. Her favorite flower is the poppy, and the leg isn't really made of cork. It couldn't be, if you think about it. Cork being too soft a wood to carry the weight of a 27-year-old girl, or even half her weight. The leg is of wood. Willow, in fact, and years ago, they made a swell wooden leg in the county of Cork. <laughs> in Ireland. Thus the name. As for the reason Zach says she lost her leg as a child, to a runaway horse and an overturned carriage she was riding in it. This gives me an idea. Zach, I say, then, if she goes out in the night in the wagon, being pulled by a horse, won't she be caused to dwell on that horrible event? shoulder. It weighs quite a lot. I'm having trouble keeping it from sliding off the bar stool under its pressure. Look, Milton, he says, I haven't been dogging you about this for your sake, much as I like you. It's Minnie who wants bad to go on this hayride. And I'm not about to disappoint her. He squeezes my shoulder like he's trying to juice an orange, and I know I better speak up quick. OK, I say. And he lets me go. That's my blue serge pal, he says. 
out of the flowers in my hand. I realize I'm crushing their stems with my fist. I try to ease up, settle down. And now her face turns and she looks at me as if she knows who I am already. I flinch a bit inside, wondering how Jack described me. But it can't be too bad, because he's responsible for setting all of this up. She snaps from the Lord. I observe this first step carefully. I am a detail man. That's my job. And I notice with the first step, which is the leg descended from the land of air and so to speak? Her left. She started from her right side. She would surely start from her good leg. And her left leg then follows a tiny bit slowly, perhaps dragging, maybe just a very little, almost imperceptibly. And it's true. If I were looking for this, and if I weren't a detail man, I'd never know. But I am, and I am, and I do. <laughs> Now underway, she seems quite natural. She has a blanket draped over the bar. Many of the girls have blankets. I noticed this with envy when I first arrived. It is mid-July, and though it can get a bit chilly, And she has been moved to bring a blanket. This is too much on my mind as she arrives before me. Are you subject to chills? Side, and I say to her low so the others can't hear. Do you know, do you know, do you know many of do these you people? Know, not a one, not a one, and you. Not a one, and you. 
Seen a couple of them around. Seen a couple of them around. Don't know any of them. Any of sex books. Not that I know of. Then this one is for us. Yes, this one is meant for us. Yes, it's definitely. like a European king or somebody passing in a carriage. Or nothing to stay blank-faced or turn away. But what would that be interpreted as a gesture of rejection or overreaching uppityness? All this goes through me like turning the crank on the arcade mutoscope real slow. Well, my arms and legs are moving in normal time and my decision is made by my indecision. I pass on with my mug fixed in what I'm sure is a mask of buffoonery. And I look ahead, and Minnie is just turning around in a spot she has found for us. And the whole batch of poppies are clenched in her teeth. She's got the stems in her mouth, and the cluster of flower heads are bunched up at her cheek. And she sees me, she sees me seeing this, and she flutters her eyebrows at me, and once again it's me, and my face trying to figure out how to act in this world, in this world. the straw to her right side, and she pats the straw to her left. I'm grateful for the instruction. <laughs> I just set my face to the place where I've been told to go, and I creep on. Meanwhile, Minnie has taken the flowers from her mouth, and she laid them on the blanket. Happily, my mind catches up. She put the bouquet in her mouth to protect them as she crawled. This makes perfectly good sense. I have arrived safely turning and falling into the head. And we are side by side. I put my hands behind me and I cross my ankles. <laughs> Her wooden leg lies between us. <laughs> evening lies before us. I figure I'm in trouble. Not that I shouldn't be prepared to simply keep quiet 
Especially considering I've been listed on this date by this girl's relative who happens to know me from a bar. And he knows how out of place I generally am. And I've agreed to it only after saying no a few times, and even written to my sister in San Francisco that I was saying no, in spite of she's the one who's always worried about me never looking up from a column of numbers in front of me to find a life with somebody. But here's a girl with a cork leg. <laughs> Not that there isn't plenty of girl left in spite of that. <laughs> but it's just the idea of this whole arrangement, which is, Let's get Milton to take out this girl who other men maybe would be uncomfortable around because Milton's hard up. And he's also a safe choice because there's not a red-blooded man inside of him. He's just got ink in his blood and ledgers on his brain and numbers on his lips. So under these circumstances, why should I care if I don't say another word the whole night? I could just lie there in the hay, get through the whole thing, and everyone will leave me alone and let me go back to my numbers. See? That's a fate even I imagined for myself at the end of a hayride with the girl. But in fact, I do expect more from myself now. I want more. It was Minnie herself who brought this out in me. Minnie raving for the Model T's headlines. Minnie who says just grab me and shove. Minnie who wants to vote. Why shouldn't she vote? Why shouldn't you vote? Well, dog, my cat. What a sweet thing to say, Milton. <laughs> of course I deserve a vote. Women deserve a vote. Women have busted a petrol seen a quicker than Exhorted me. Thank you for saying so, Milton. Then the choir begins to sing. <laughs> At first, the sound strangely seems to be happening all inside my head. But then the voice is coarser and the music is not Bach. Since 
January, February, June, and July. This is true, certainly. You could tote up all my Januaries and Februaries and so forth for the whole year, or for all my years. Even counting the ones since I hit adolescence, that's better. It's about 300 months. I can work up an exact sum tomorrow if I want, but <laughs> now everything goes a little sour in my head. I realize that given my ineptness at the loving and the spoon in it all, I'll be adding this present month of July to the tally in spite of this handwriting. And the voices roll into a verse. I can't see why a boy should sign and by his side is a girl he loves so true. All you have to say is, won't you be my bride, for I love you. Why should I be telling you the secret when I know that you can guess? Harvest Spoon will smile, shine on all the while, if the little girl should answer yes. So do I, and of course I sigh. Minnie's not singing along, but she's smiling into the wagon. And then she lays her head back on the hay. Minnie and I lie there and listen, side by side. The moon shining over us and the stars. Ha, <laughs> ha, 
music is over, everyone's laughing and applauding themselves. And then Minnie turns her face to me and she winks. <laughs> I have, of course, no earthly idea what she means by this exactly, but I dare now to think that I'm pretty okay for the moment with this very progressive girl. With this girl who would bust the trust and still has it in her to wink. The madness of speech comes upon me again, apropos of nothing but the chaos in my head. I'm gonna vote in October, like I said before, for women to vote. Oh, that's right. That's just the way to waltz me around and around, Willie. I'm glad my jaw is locked shut because I'm about to impulsively correct her about my name. But I stay quiet long enough to get what she means. How clever she's made me out to be. Now, inspired, I wink. Aren't you feeling a little bit chilled? No. <laughs> I'm actually feeling quite flushed, probably due to the rapid disintegration of my brain cells. I look to see what Minnie is seeing. Several other couples are opening their blankets and disappearing under them. Yes. <laughs> Minnie looks at me, and of course I'm driven to explanation. The valley gets chilly. It's all the orchards. You know, somehow the trees absorb the heat, perhaps to make it chilly. There's no real statistics on that, however. It's probably just northern California. <laughs> the climate. You know. So, you're chilly? <laughs> yes. She reaches beside her and opens the blanket. She flashes it up and it settles over the two of us. Up to our shoulders. How's that? Fine. <laughs> We lie back, watch the night sky. We do that for quite a while, not saying anything. And we're still not touching at all. Except maybe just barely along the upper arms, but that might be my imagination. <laughs> We head out into one of the big apricot orchards. There's still the smell of sulfur smoke lingering in the air from the curing houses. Do you remember last year? And I know at once what she's thinking. It's because of the night sky and the acrid smell. When we were waiting to pass through the tail of Haley's Comet, did you think that life on Earth would come to an end? Not for a moment. Not for a moment. The, the tail looked pretty substantial across the night sky. We passed through 48 trillion cubic miles of it. And of course, it was highly reflective of the sunlight. But you have to understand that there's only about one molecule of poison per cubic yard. And considering it takes 10,000 sextillion cyanogen molecules to weigh one pound, then a little figuring would have told us that the sum total of poison gas the planet was about to pass through weighed barely half an ounce. And I instantly realize how it is that even correctly gathered and accurately calculated numbers can sometimes be irrelevant. I also understand how much I adore this mini of the Willow Lake. There is a comet of desire running through me, and its tail is thick with something much denser than Haley's poison. I am suddenly desperate to touch this girl. Just lay a hand on her, or brush at her hair with my fingertips. Something. But I have neither the courage nor confidence. Then I am seized by a plan. No matter what scientists announce, scientists are constantly saying things and then taking them back. I think of her artificial leg lying between us, hidden beneath the blanket. It's not a rational thing. The leg is 
part of many bugs. It really isn't. <laughs> We're not always rational creatures. <laughs> so it stands to reason that a touch there would not constitute an actual offense. That is to say, <laughs> the flagrant act of a masher. <laughs> It's a leg, after all, which is a powerful part of a girl. Indeed, it's not really a leg. It's a piece of wood. It's really as if you were with a girl who walked with a cane, and you touched the cane, which is no offense at all. And yet, from my own comet's point of view, it is her own. Sweet willow leg, and it's attached to her, so it would still be a thrillingly tender connection to her, while at the same time being a connection that nobody in the world would know about. Not even her, <laughs> especially <laughs> under a blanket. And even if they did know about it, it's not like touching the actual girl. Sometimes you have to face a difficult thing. I turn my attention to my right hand. My hand is only too willing to dash ahead. And I glance down the blanket, gauging the contours, and my hand slithers along humpbacked under the cloth like a mole making for the roses, <laughs> which in this case is a place just below her artificial knee. You think you might die. And even if it never was so, just thinking of it is more or less the same. Moles are blind, but they have other highly refined senses. And so it is with my hand, which expertly arrives on the scene and lifts and curls and descends slowly, delicately, and many sighs, and she says, I didn't have it too bad, though. And then I touch her, or more precisely, her skirt. Did you know that people actually took one look at the comet and died? The call is crippled, meaning my mom. Now I slow down for a moment, make the 
the squeezes on and lingering Something like religious ecstasy I guess I'm Here, sweetie, take this long caress Here, sweet thought, just above the knee A long caress for you Further down than further off. Sometimes we're compelled to embrace the very thing that we fear the most urgently. But her face doesn't turn to me with this question. It's just as well. It's all I can do to keep my eyes from rolling back in my head in something like religious ecstasy. I'm vaguely aware of a stir. I looked down the length of the blanket, and I nearly gasped. Mr. Mole was racing furiously up and down there, absolutely crazed. I watched for a moment in awe. It's my hand. It's my own hand, frenzied with love. I can stop it if I choose, and so I do. And I send out the message. I had this bad news for it, and it stops. My hand. Yes. That's natural. My hand is still lying on her leg. I let myself have this one last touch. And then I remove my hand from her leg and put it at my side. I focus on catching my breath. Minnie suddenly lifts her face to the night sky and says, Do you want to count all the constellations? Sure. I know something about that.
So we traced them out together, these patterns in the sky. I count the stars and make them up while she talks about bears and archers and hunters with swords. When we returned to the gates of the ironworks, I held Minnie down. eventually happened with them. Uh, it's the third largest collectible in the world, actually, and so there's a pretty big infrastructure. So I'd haunt uh, Holiday Inns uh, here and there, where uh, 30 or 40 postcard dealers on a weekend would rent a ballroom, and there'd be literally 15 million postcards in the in Holiday Inn. And it's a, for me, the interesting thing was not so much the images on the front, which is what the dealers cared about, but rather the messages written on the backs. Um, and the cards that I was interested in mostly uh, uh, were between 1906, which was a hallmark year. Uh, that's when the, um, it was, uh, the divided back was 
permitted on a picture postcard. And it was legal for the first time to write on the back of a card. <laughs> so between 1906 and 1917 were the, the, the big years. And what, what happened was, uh, this was before automobiles were established. Uh, eight or 10 miles even was a, a big, insuperable distance. Um, and before telephones. But every, in, in that era, every city and town in the United States had at least two mail deliveries a day. And so someone in the morning could get a passing thought or feeling, write it in a very condensed form, send it off, and receive an answer in the afternoon. It was, in short, the early 20th century's Twitter. Or email. <laughs> text, text message. Text message. Text. Even better. Yes, yeah. it's the text message. Um, so, uh, what I would find then, and, and my interest in, in, in these things was, I guess, already plugging into my my fiction writerly self, was this intense, concentrated, subtext-rich message, and. Eventually, after 15 years of Sunday afternoons sitting and reading these cards and imagining people, um, I finally realized that, that, these, that these people were fully formed now in my writerly unconscious as characters, many of them. And I chose my 15 favorite stories, and my uh, publisher loved the idea, and we, we eventually, uh, uh, I wrote the full story. And I um, actually have here, this wonderful world we live in. I'd forgotten about this, but I downloaded it on my Kindle here, uh, my Kindle app. Uh, here's what the postcard said. This was a real postcard. This is a real human being. Milton lived, although all we know about him in, in a strict, literal, autobiographical way was in this one postcard. But uh, here we go. This is real. The front of the postcard again, not, not much relevant. Uh, a, a woman sitting on a beach under a parasol. That's all it is, an image. And this is the postcard that started the whole story. The whole story. The postcard on the back, the postmark is Sunnyvale, California, July 14th, 1911. It's addressed to Miss M. Bros, 219 <laughs> Hearst Avenue, San Francisco, California. Dear Matilda, just a line to let you know I am still alive. I am not going on that hayride. The young man that wants me to go with his sister-in-law, but she has a cork leg. I am awful tired, that is the main reason. Regards to all Milton. <laughs> That's all there was. <laughs> Very interesting. When ha the book is called Had a Good Time. There are 14 more stories like this. And um, it was published in 2004. Back then we did a lot more book touring than we do now. I did 40 cities for this, uh, for this book. One of them was San Francisco. I had a rental car, free afternoon. I gave her, was going to read the reading that night in a wonderful independent bookstore, which probably doesn't exist anymore, called Clean Well Lighted Place. <laughs> but in that afternoon, I thought, 219 Hearst Avenue, I wonder. Mm -hmm. So I got in the car, drove out. It's in the Mission District. The street was full of cars, but I found a place to park a few, a few numbers up from this place. I had my book with me. I got out, walked along the sidewalk, and arrived in front of 219. And there was a man on the front porch sweeping the porch. So I got my courage up. I said, hello, I have something interesting to say to you. <laughs> Showed him, told him about the story. He was delighted. He invited me into his house. He bought it six weeks earlier. It's this wonderful little Mission Street bungalow. And no furniture in there yet. He was doing some light restoration. He showed me, as when you buy a house, you get the book of deeds and all the transfers of the property. And lo and behold, in 1890 or so, there was, those, where was the Bros family who had bought this house. So I, you know, <laughs> there they were. I stood in the, in, the, in the very 
front room where Matilda Brose, or Miss M. Brose, I've, I've assumed the Matilda. Oh, no, she does say Matilda. She does say Matilda. Yeah. We've got Matilda. So Matilda Brose stood in this very spot where I stood a hundred years earlier and read her postcard from Milton. So that's, that was the, the origin of the, the story and the book. Uh, yeah. Questions? Wonderful. <laughs> talk a little bit about what his inspiration was in uh, putting Ms. Uh, Bob's words into music. Um, Michael organized the reading at Barnes & Noble on, on 66th Street. Yeah, which is no longer. Louder. Yeah, and we did a, That's about to a celebrate. It's going to get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lady is, and, and, um, made a few words. But. There, there were mentioned, as you heard, actual songs from 1911. He used actual songs from 1911. And uh, Michael invited me to play those songs, Shine on Harvest Moon, uh, Boop, 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 Make a Noise Like a Hoop, and uh, other ditty. And also, oh, you're uh, kiddo. Yeah. also, Waltz Me Around Again, Willie. My grandfather would sing, Oh, You Spearmint Kiddo, to me. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so from that, I thought that the, the rest of this beautiful story could make music. Started it. I mean, well, took all the materials and put it together. Yeah. So we, um, I have been inspired by Bob's. Well, it was so hard to describe it in one word, but just this very gifted man. And I didn't know who he was, but I found one of his short stories, a different, which is part of the collection called uh, "Mother in the Trenches," which was based on, by, on a postcard of a woman standing in a trench somewhere, and then he envisioned it as a World War One mother. And that was a dramatic story that moved me deeply that I read in Harper's Magazine maybe 15 years ago. And I was, um, at that time, I was uh, mostly focusing on writing. And so I adapted that into a short story. And then when you told me that this was coming out, this collection of short stories, then I thought, well, what can we do to celebrate the launch here in New York? So we took three of those stories, The Mother in the Trenches. And then we took, um, then I discovered this, um, the story, the Ironworkers Hayride, and I fell in love with Milton right away. And so then I performed Milton then as just a, just a straight piece. And then we had two other performers. Andre DeShields did a solo piece about um, a retired... Uncle Joseph, yeah. Uh, Uncle, Uncle Joseph. Joseph I Uncle think Joseph. About a, about a slave. And um, anyway, then another one was done by Jana Robbins, who, who did... Um, Mother in the Trenches. Mother in the Trenches. But then, and then I invited Laney to come along and create a soundscape. And so then when Laney came along and played that, and then he became inspired when he, once he heard the story, right? And then Laney and I spoke about it, and then he slogged away for several years to create. This is, how many pages of music is this? About 170? Uh, it didn't even count. It's, it's very <laughs> About 170 <laughs> pages of music. A lot of literally. music. And I am so sorry you didn't get to hear some of the beauty of his music when the piano went haywire and started adding notes and chords that don't belong. <laughs> but oh, his music is just so well put together, so beautiful. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Do you have any questions? Are there any audience questions? Um, yes. Yeah, I was particularly um, cheered, kind of inspired, when you began singing this alternating duet. It reminded me a little bit of Gilbert and Sullivan. Oh, although, no. although you didn't get quite that slapstick, the point was that it was just so appropriate that I, you know, you must have been inspired by memories of your own adolescence, maybe, Milton? <laughs> yeah, well, ask Lenny. I mean, he's the, he's the one that put, did, right. did well, all of that. Right, well, Lenny did that. It's a really that. great thing. Thank you. I love that part. Appreciate that. We like comments. Anybody? Yes? So what are you going to do with it now? You can't let it just sit there. Yeah. We don't want to. We would love, we need to find financial backing, of course, Walmart to, to bring this forward. <laughs> but uh, we very much want to uh, to expand it, um, add a second act, probably one of his other postcards. Well, I mean, yeah, actually, yeah. We're, we're thinking about going back to Mother in the Trenches, which is, uh, some of you may have heard this, was, it was done in Symphony Space that um, that National Public Radio uh, yeah. uh, uh -huh. selected, selected short series. Ready. It's it's been um, it's been read and reread and, and and it's it's appeared on NPR I don't know eight or ten times, 
and um, it's a very timely story. It, that postcard it was what they called a real photo postcard. Uh, back then, in that same era, was the era of the brownie camera when people suddenly could take their own photographs. And they would take photographs and then they'd have them printed on postcard bags. And so, on top of the literally a billion postcards a year being sent in the United States, many of them were people's own photographs. And this one is a photograph of a stocky, middle aged woman in, in a black dress and a cloche standing behind a boiling, steaming pot in the bottom of a World War I trench. And the only thing written on the card was mother in, beneath it, mother in the trenches. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wrote her story. And I think the, 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 the natural thing to do, uh, you know, I, they've been doing this for 10 years, and I've lived a 1,000 miles away. I saw this myself for the first time last night. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was the I'm the librettist because they used literally all all the words. Although the, the 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 variations they did, for instance, that making that a duet and adding uh, extending the the observation of the sky was a brilliant you know adaptive oh, yeah, the final know, duet touch. That was, was terrific. Was all Lanny. No, no, yeah, you guys, uh, you know, I, I was <laughs> thrilled with. I came being honest. I have no expectations or try to keep, you know, modest ones. And I, I was absolutely thrilled by this. These folks are too fabulous. But, but we, I realized last night, I think we all realized, that you can't, what this was, you can't touch it. I came in before last night thinking, well, we can add a song here, we can expand it. What we're going to do is add a second act. We'll do two stories, a light and a dark, mother in the trenches, and the Iron Workers Hayride, probably mother first, I would guess, and, and let this carry people out, out the door. So, so, that's, those, yeah. so for those of you keep an eye on us, and, and if you see Iron Workers Hayride come back, definitely come support us, and anybody who would like to come on the journey with us, mm -hmm. uh, we, we would definitely be welcoming collaborators on this. Yeah. We have um, a Facebook page, <laughs> so that's a great way to contact us, Iron Workers Hayride. Also, one thing we neglected to mention is that uh, our director, unfortunately, could not be here tonight, uh, Eric Michael Gillette, and we owe him a lot. Uh, he's the one that conceptualized it. It's just very challenging, he's as you can imagine. He's the one staging. Right. If you think about how to take something from a literary text and how do you make it work on the stage, and, and because of Milton going in out of the fourth wall and, you know, being in the store narrating and what's it's all going on inside his head. And Minnie and staying you, within only the context of the story. Right. And that and was so, his brilliance in being able yeah. to put that put that out there. Yeah, so we want to thank him. He had to he had an engagement in today in uh, the Hamptons that he couldn't get out of. Mm -hmm. So that's why he couldn't be here tonight. But. And as you know, we also had lighting issues. <laughs> so Let's my grand entrance. Let's not talk about that. that. <laughs> so we do hope to be able to do We don't again. know. We, we don't, don't know. notice that. Probably huh? enchanting. I want a sequel. Awesome. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.